Thank you very much for asking me to give a talk on my Proof Animals Have Soul series. And I am extremely grateful to anybody who takes the time and trouble to give me any survival accounts of animals. I'd be very grateful. And if you find it's um, too much trouble to email and write them all out, I'm very happy to talk to you on WhatsApp or Messenger or Zoom and I can either record it or write it out on your behalf and um, it would be, um, I'd be very grateful. So here is the talk on proof animals have souls. Um, but just beforehand, I thought I'd give you a moment or two of background on myself because I've only just started to join the uh, Zoom group, which I'm very much enjoying everybody's talks and look forward to listening to plenty more. Um, I'm an author of three books. Um, Moses and Jesus, the Shamans was the first book. And um, the Proof Animals Have Souls series is the um, series. And the first of that is Proof Animals Have Souls. And the second is 500 plus celebrities go vegetarian. And that's quotes. It's got about 800 quotes. It's not um, a read as such. It's 800 quotes um, from people from Confucius to the Buddha to Jesus um, to Plato, Pythagoras, right up to people like Paul McCartney, um, Oscar Wilde. It's quotes throughout um, the centuries on animal issues, showing compassion to animals and how much more compassion we might show to each other. Um, the book cover tries to um, give the series goal. It was a picture I had in my mind um, to try and prove to people that all organisms survive death. Um, we're from the ancient fish to the amphibian to the primate. And then you can see the angel up in the far right corner and that we're all on the same journey together. I'd like to show that all life forms have a central nucleus, which I call the eternal energy or consciousness or, um, or spirit, or if people are religious, they might want to call it that God spark, that eternal energy that survives physical death. Um, I did an MPhil, which was in three classes of spiritually transformative psychic experiences, shamanic out-of-body and near-death experiences. And then I went on to a PhD, which helped me to write up years of um, work of which I'd gathered on mediumship for many years, looking at the authenticity of different types of mediumship and the mediumistic roots of spirituality. Um, I was lucky to have Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Fenske um, the former president of the Spiritual Frontiers International and former president and editor of IANS, the International uh, uh, Association for Near-Death Studies, and had uh, external examiners, which was Professor Carl Lindgren, Dr. Crawford Knox. Um, it was the Church's Fellowship who taught me... Um, can you see okay? Is that all right? It was the Church's Fellowship of Psychic and Spiritual Studies um, that introduced me to um, Reverend Dr. Fensky and also to a department in America of the Consciousness Studies and Sacred Traditions. It's not parapsychology, it was to paranormal and spirituality, and that's why I differ from uh, many uh, parapsychologists. Um, Diane Corcoran of IAMS, president, who did her degree there, and my earlier degrees were at Lancaster and um, Strathclyde University, which brought me up to Glasgow. Before that, I was living in Jordan in the Middle East. Um, just to say that Professor Archie Roy, he was um, a friend. I was probably the, one of the first to join his Scottish Society for Psychical Research. I'd known him for about 30, 40 years. Um, and he kindly wrote the foreword to my first book, Moses and Jesus, the Shamans. And Gordon Higginson, um, the former long-term president of the Arthur Finlay College, a very accurate trance and physical phenomena medium. Um, he was a decades long friend and became very much a spiritual father. And um, I would, somebody kindly gave me a, a rose from his coffin when I was at his funeral. He, he was taken long before his time, but I'm sure in the spirit world he's busy and he was taken for reasons that I don't know. Um, I've been a tutor for psychical research at mul multiple colleges and universities in the UK including Strathclyde University and the University of Western Scotland, both of those around Glasgow, and Warwick University in England. 
and I was the book review editor for the Academy for Spiritual and Consciousness Studies. Um, you're talking to a person who's had a, a lifetime of personal and observational proof that we all survive physical death. And I believe we're a given knowledge so that we can share it for, to others. And when I was at a physical um, phenomena evening with Gordon, uh, we were all told that we were there for a purpose. And I felt it was so that we could share that knowledge with others. Um, and for me, um, I like to now raise awareness of animal sentience and souls and the continuity of life after death for all life forms. Hoping to end animal slaughter because for me, I believe Auschwitz continues in the slaughterhouses every day. Um, I've observed Gordon Higginson's aura readings where he interpret the colours of people's auras, um, his mediumship and his materialisations. I've observed countless mediums over decades and listened to direct voice trance spiritual philosophy, which I am very interested in. And I've had personal experiences myself. There was a time I hemorrhaged and was very ill and my dog Jack had passed about a month before and she lay on my right calf and I could feel the fur and the warmth of her body. And Sue, my other dog, after she passed at the age of 16, um, her bed was beside the fire and I kept seeing this pink haze beside her bed and wherever the bed was moved to, um, that pink haze was there. I've learned a lot from the coloured circles of colour, um, which I will give a word about in a moment. And I've seen and heard uh, spirit and I've had precognitive dreams. And I've also received about 40 poems, which are tragically sad poetry, um, which are really sadly, sadly poetry from the souls of spirit animals. I have five dogs and obviously they will live with me till the end and um, all the others live to good ages as well and I do feel the terrible plight of um, the animals and I've been a long-term vegetarian and that's where my um, watching spirit and learning from spirit has taken me but we all have an individual journey. Um, there was one Christmas time I'd become engaged to my husband um, we were beside the sea in a hotel at Christmas time. It was full of energy, full of happy, lively people. And whether that's what brought it in, I don't know. Um, but there were circles of colour floating around the room. Each one had a yellow nucleus, so they all had that in common. And I took that to be their eternal energy or consciousness or spirit or soul that which doesn't um, die at death, but transcends in form. Each of the concentric circles of color were different. And if Gordon had been there, he probably would have interpreted the different colors, telling me the emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical of those people. And I probably then would have recognized who they were. But for me, I saw the circles of color and what I took from it is everybody and every animal and all life forms have got that central energy that cannot be destroyed. This is a picture of one of my dogs. This is little Lizzie. She's the one who would sit still for the camera. I know people have uh, aura cameras and aura videos uh, because the aura is a dynamic moving thing and we also have core colors. And as we think the colors change, um, but these were Lizzie's colours at that point in time. And it was interesting that it came up that she was a healer because she is very much that type of personality too. And that connects with the circles of colour that I believe that's us in spirit form. Just energy, eternal energy, and that we all have it. In one of my classes in the University of the West of Scotland, um, formerly Paisley University, um, one of the students brought this photograph in of her cat who was very close to the hamster. They were best buddies. Sadly, the hamster passed away and one evening she was sitting uh, reading and she saw the hamster in spirit run across the floor and if you look to the radiator to the left, you'll see that circle 
And she said, that's where she photographed it. And that's how it um, manifested on her camera. So again, it's like that orb or circle of color. Um, this picture here gives you um, a bit of an idea. It's one I just picked up from the internet um, to try and elaborate on what I'm saying, that that central nucleus, whether it's God, Allah, Brahman, the source, or whether we just take it to be the eternal energy, um, it's just to give you a, a little bit of a diagram. And to see that energy within all beings. And because there's a continuum of animal consciousness, all possess that integral immortal energy, which I keep saying is spirit, soul, or consciousness. Um, and remember that humans are animals. We are mammals and primates. We've got tails and gill slits in the human womb. And it's impossible, I believe, to arbitrarily dictate which organisms survive death and which organisms don't. To me, it's all life forms. Sorry, it's jumped ahead. Oh gosh, where did we get to? Sorry. Um, I believe there's a non-existent line of demarcation between us and other animals. And I believe all organisms are unanimously composed of energy. And as I say, I regard this universally mortal energy as eternal, recognizable, and it's individual consciousness. And there's a picture again of that auric um, orb and the picture of Lizzie, just as an example. And that goes through all life forms. Um, it's important to point out how similar we are to all animals. Um, because even birds dream, animals dream, and that is called rapid eye movement. They demonstrate REM sleep. I've seen it with my dogs. Um, they sleep in our bedroom and it's little noises they make and their legs are running and you wonder what happy dreams they might be having that night. Um, but learning how much animals and birds dream I fear the nightmares animals must have in animal experiment laboratories and filthy overcrowded factory farm hell houses and slaughterhouses. And animals demonstrate the whole gamut of emotions just like us. And even the highest gallantry laying their lives down for another. You have the self-sacrificing fox who runs as a decoy to take the hunters away from her young. And then there was the case of the dog George there's many, many more cases. Um, he lived in New Zealand and this little Jack Russell fought off pit bulls so that children could try and run away as they were being attacked. And he was sent a medal. Um, again, the highest gallantry, laying his life down for another. Um, Mark Beckoff describes sentience as the ability to feel, perceive or be conscious or to experience subjectivity. And Carl Sagan talks about humans who enslave or castrate or experiment on or fillet other animals have had to under have a, an understandable penchant for pretending animals don't feel pain. And that we make a sharp distinction between ourselves and them. And yet we are all animals. They, and as he concludes here, they are just too much like us. Um, Mark Beckhoff talks about the database of research on animal sentiments as strong and rapidly growing. And he talks about the emotions ranging from the joy and happiness to deep sadness and grief and even post-traumatic stress disorder, along with empathy, jealousy and resentment. And they've even discovered that mice, rats and chickens display empathy and countless other surprises are emerging amongst animal scientists. And Helen Proctor, you may be interested in the website, it's the Sentience Mosaic, and she leads the World Society for the Protection of Animals, WISPA, and they alone have collected over 2,500 articles by researchers confirming animals have sentience just like us. And then we have um, the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness at Cambridge University on the 7th of July, 2012. 
um, Stephen Hawkins and the world's most esteemed scientists um, issued a declaration on um, animal, animals being sentient. Um, just to give you a little bit on that, that non-human animals have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical and neurophysiological substrates of consciousness. Um, that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. I often think we want to meet other beings on other planets, and yet we don't know too much about all those beautiful beings who live on our planet. Um, Professor Mark Beckoff, on his Universal Declaration of Animal Sentience, he wants to take it a stage further. The Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, he wants to make it universal um, because for some reason it doesn't seem to be universal. And he says it's an indisputable fact that animals are sentient. They can suffer and feel pain as recognized by the Treaty of Lisbon and the rapidly growing field of compassionate conservation. And there's evidence of animal sentience, sentience is everywhere. Mark Beckoff also agrees with the solid evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin and Darwin's findings regarding evolutionary continuity, which is a bit like the picture on the cover of the Proof Animal Have Souls book. Uh, Darwin recognized that the differences among species in anatomical, physiological, and psychological traits are differences in degree rather than kind, and supports the wide-ranging acceptance of animal sentience. The, there are shades of gray, not black and white differences. So if people have a trait, they, meaning animals, have it too. This is called evolutionary continuity, and it shows it's bad biology to rob animals of the traits they clearly possess. And one telling example, humans share with other mammals and vertebrates is the same areas of the brain that are important for consciousness and processing emotions. So just because they cannot speak to us in the way that we speak, uh, these little beings are very much the same of, uh, as us. And as I say, I believe they also have the same um, God spark or central energy nucleus that continues after physical death. Um, they're sentient like humans. And Mark Beckoff, Professor Mark Beckoff, says people surely are not exceptional or alone in the are arena of sentience. And for us to abandon our anthropocentric view that only the big brained animals have mental capacities for complex forms of sentience and consciousness. It's time to stop pretending that we don't know animals are sentient. And it's safe to say, he says, that animals want to live in peace and safety and absent from fear and pain, just as we do. Um, this one is quite heart rendering that he says the time is now to shelve outdated and unsupported ideas about animal sentience and to factor sentience into all of the numeral ways in which we encounter other animals. When the Cambridge Declaration was made, he talks about the pomp and champagne and the media coverage. But he says for the Universal Declaration on Animal Sentence, Sentience, it should be a deep and personal and often an inspirational journey that comes from our hearts and such a realization has a strong and rapidly growing evidence-based foundation. And he says, the animals will be grateful and warmly thank us for paying attention to the science of animal sentience. And when we listen to our hearts, we're recognizing how much we know about what other animals are feeling and that we owe it to them to protect them however we can. And he says, please, let's do it now. It's easy to do and we should do no less. Um, I can tell you also about parrots, um, dogs, cats, sheep. Just to give you a very brief um, summary, Irene Pepperberg, she worked with Alex the parrot, and he associated human words with meanings using his IQ, and he used his IQ to apply it to abstract concepts, counting, colors, and shapes. And he performed all sorts of cognitive assignments similar to dolphins, chimpanzees, and human children. 
And this one is another interesting one. Jane Goodall worked with Nikisi the parrot, who demonstrated 950 words using innovative behavior. So it wasn't just memory. And Jane Goodall went to visit Nikisi in Nikisi's New York home. And when there, Nikisi greeted with her with got a chimp. And she was quite taken aback. And then they realized that Nikisi had seen photos some time before of Goodall with chimps in Africa. So he had remembered it and recognized her and put them together. Um, in 2011, there's an example of Dalila Bove from a Parisian university. And she was demonstrating how parrots perform teamwork, uh, two birds pulling a string together and one releasing a food tray so the other can pull it away from the test equipment so that they can eat together. And that research is increasingly now advancing from anthropocentric tests of consciousness to species specific tests, such as dogs do the sniff test to confirm familiarity rather than the appearance alone. When our dogs come in and out from the garden, they do sniff each other to check who they are in case it's a different dog coming in. Um, even octopuses, they're performing maze tests and problem-solving sol problem tests, revealing a high IQ and an excellent short and long-term memories. They've demonstrated the ability to learn between different shapes and colors. And they play with toys in their tanks when bored. And they throw and catch toys using the aquarium's water movement current. So they'll throw the toy out and it'll go round in the circle back to them and then they'll throw it off again. Um, sometimes when they've come back, it, one of the uh, octopus has moved out of one aquarium and chosen to settle in another preferred tank. And in the wild, they embark on ships, they open storerooms and eat the contents. And the veined octopus, they salvage broken coconut shells, they move them, reconstruct them and they make themselves new homes in them. Um, pigs have been found to have the intelligence of a three-year-old child. Pigs play video games at PlayStations, scoring higher than primates regularly. Exceptional memories. Um, in the wild, they have complex community networks. They're naturally clean. They don't soil their habitat and pigs don't sweat. Um, they love a mental challenge and they love problem-solving tasks. And interestingly, they demonstrate lateral learning thinking through behavior. For example, uh, when they were asked to play indoor golf, that's a saucer with a hole in it on a carpet. They'd nose the ball to the hole in the saucer, but very quickly decided, why do this when it's much quicker to pick the saucer up and place it on top of the ball? And this is an example of lateral learning, thinking through a task. And another example, a man was walking and the pig was weaving in and out. This was the trick. And when the man decided to walk backwards, the pig weaved in and out backwards too. Um, scientists, including Dr. Donald Bloom of the UK government, um, agree that pigs have the cognitive ability to be quite sophisticated, even more so than dogs and certainly three-year-old children, human children. So it's showing more and more how all life forms are similar, and I believe we all have that eternal energy within us. Um, we could look at chickens, and when Dr. Chris Evans talks about chickens in conferences, people think he's talking about primates, when he's actually showing that chickens are demonstrating the same IQ as dogs, cats, and many primates, which is really surprising. There's a lady locally, and she rescues chickens, and she pays the same for them as you pay in the supermarket, but before they've been slaughtered. And um, she gives them names and the feathers grow back in. And she's often described um, them as having such individual personalities. And turkeys have been found to chirp to their favorite music. Um, smart animals with personality, community orientated. Ducks and geese live to the age of 25. They're loyal, they're protective. And interestingly, if their sibling or partner is ever wounded or unable to fly, for example, going south for the winter, they accompany them and leave the formation knowing that they will be left too. Um, and when the sibling or partner might die, at least they've accompanied them. And then they often never take a partner again. 
And cows, high IQ, strong family ties. They've been known to jump six foot fences and swim rivers to escape slaughter. They've walked seven miles to find a calf being sold at auction. They cry for 12 weeks typically when a calf, baby calf is taken for cramped dark veal crates. And they perform problem solving tasks. And some of these have included learning to turn lights on and off and food switches on and off when they want the light and when they want the food. And of fish, Dr. Sylvia Earle, a marine biologist, talks about how sensitive and good-natured they are with individual characters and outstanding memories and how they learn from each other and recognize their shoal mates. So again, this aura, this auric energy, I believe it's in all beings and in all life forms. And living with my dogs, I've learned they dream, they've got personalities, they've got wonderful love and loyalty, they do feel pain, they are children. And we have to fuss each one equally so that nobody is upset. They, it, it's like a kindergarten here with the five of them. And they have taught me a lot. And before these five, I had Sue who went on to 16 and we Jack who also went on to a ripe old age. There was only Edward who passed um, and he was a rescue and he had a, a drug addict owner and after having him for five years it seemed that um, the injuries he'd sustained in the past in his brain unfortunately killed him when he'd found his forever home only after five years with us. But all of them have taught me so much and I ask, we shouldn't ask how clever these souls are, just simply, can they feel emotional and physical pain like us? And I believe these loving uh, little creatures, all of them, yes, they do. Uh, remember, this one is the animals, uh, sorry, the human animals. Um, we have tails and gill slits in the womb, and some people are born with those tails, which obviously need to be amputated at a later date. So it just reminds us of our ancestry and our connection with other animals that we seem to often forget. And here is an unfortunate man who was born with the hair. And here is a human embryo with the gill slits and the chicken embryo with the gill slits. And also you can see the human embryo with the tail and the chicken embryo with the tail. And how we are all one big earth family. Um, and just to point out that primates are animals and mammals and interestingly that includes humans and monkeys and chimpanzees and apes we've only got 1.2 percent genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees we're so closely linked in anatomy and genetics and the problem has been this cognitive dissonance that comes from the western world's science um, the Western world's God is science today, which negates and ridicules people's psychic mediumistic experiences. And that's why I didn't feel I was drawn to being a parapsychologist. I wasn't interested in dismissing people's experiences as um, hallucinations and aberrations. Um, I felt it was the limited current worldview of science. Science can't explain things, so it says they don't exist. But I have now found a professor, William Tiller. He's the professor emeritus of Stanford University. His book's mentioned at the bottom there, The Psychoenergetic Science, A Second Copernican Scale Revolution. And he has seen the problem that people have experiences of animals, see animals, and we see other spirits. And people have all sorts of psychic phenomena and science tells them it didn't happen. But he is saying the psychoenergetic phenomena of nature are not going to evaporate and disappear. The real message for the world scientific community from the presence of such data is that our present reference frame for viewing the many phenomena of nature is not large enough to encompass a reliable, internally consistent description of all of nature's phenomena. So he says it's past time for us to change all that. And thankfully he has with his second Copernican scale revolution. Um, Tiller's revolutionary psychoenergetic science reformats reality into two unique states, conventional matter 
and a magnetic information wave level of matter. The two physical realities interact via a higher dimensional coupling mechanism, vital for manifestations within the two levels following their interaction. So Tiller is expanding the concept of Einstein's E equals MC squared uh, equation, hypothesizing that mass is transmuted into energy, becoming information and consciousness. And that is what I felt many, many years ago, not as a scientist, but as an observation, a personal experience of my circles of color with the yellow nucleus that they all shared. Um, my seal Ledworth, with all his qualifications, talks about Tiller, um, and he's pointed out that Tiller uh, was a, a scientific heretic. You know, he didn't follow the herd, but he has rigorous verification why a new paradigm is called for in the scientific interpretation of reality, and that a wide audience among the new generation of scientists will be pleased with this, and so will the other millions of people from every race and culture who have grown weary of the old science versus religion and consciousness morass. You know, we are people who know that this phenomena exists, and luckily we have now found a man who is giving the scientific um, explanation for it. Ingo Swan, as well, is um, talking about the advances in quantum mechanics and subquantum physics and interdimensional theory and how it's shedding light on the non-material and parapsychological phenomena and that Tiller is brilliantly unfolding a beginning map showing the reality or the actuality of stuff beyond or para to our physicality so thankfully we have now found somebody who is explaining people's experiences in scientific terms rather than negating them there's an enormous volume of historic and ongoing global evidence um, for animal post-death survival. And it comes from different sources, which makes it even more evidential. Three sources of evidential data confirming animals' post-death survival. Obviously, we have the mediumistic accounts of spirit animals are seen and heard by clairvoyants and clairaudience and clairsentients who sense them. They give very detailed and descriptive evidential accounts. Personal accounts, when I hemorrhaged and my dog Jack was laying across my leg, I could feel the warmth of her body. I could feel the fur. She was there. Um, I was very ill due to a loss of, great loss of blood. And it seems I was more on that side of life than this. Um, but it was so evidential. And I would be very, very interested to pe uh, for people to kindly give me their personal accounts. The third one is the ITC trance images, instrumental trance communication. They're striking, they're remarkably accurate photographs, photographing spirit animals. And then we have the electronic voice phenomena, animal voice recordings, astonishingly accurate, audible evidence of spirit animals. But, and what I believe is all animals have no shadowy left behind energy state. It's a responsive communicating. It's dynamically surviving, continuing afterlife existence, just like ours. Moving on, um, we've got evidence of dogs, cats, birds, horses, parrots. Um, Annabella, Dr. Annabella Cordoso, in Vigo in Spain. She's a highly professional instrumental trance communication expert and she used to have her ITC journals and there's images of spirit animals in those and she has written several books now. I think she's done two, um, possibly audio books because of the voice recordings of spirit animals. And she talks about Nisha, her treasured dog. Um, she's got the voice recordings of uh, Nisha. And there's the French speaking Mary Vaughan and Yves Andre's contact with Tully, their daughter's deceased dog. And it's interesting that the dogs actually spoke with a human voice. And Nisha spoke saying, Me, I understand everything. And um, it's documented that the Dre's have recorded the voice of, de of deceased cats, birds, and horses.
In March 1999, Cardoso had a long direct radio voice recording and in the background she heard bird song and when she spoke to the communicators they confirmed that they did have a bird with them. There's also Darren and Alex Williams communications with their beloved dog named Fox and I'll show you some photographs of these in a minute. And also Sonia Rinaldi did a paper on the contact with animals and she was talking about Claudio Brazil's deceased parrot, Lorinho, who spoke in a parrot's voice in Portuguese. So there's an amazing world that is opening up to us. Um, obviously, this isn't the original. It's from the ITC journal of, um, uh, from Spain, Vigo, Annabella Cordoso. And this is the deceased dog named Fox. And he's communicating with Alex. This one I think is particularly good. It's Sonia Rinaldi um, in Brazil, the other ITC expert. And she has Nitinha, a deceased dog, providing evidence of animal after death survival. And that one looks so clear, even though it's not the original, it's on the slide here. Um, it really does show up as the dog. It's uh, remarkably accurate and how people can uh, push these things aside, that's then cognitive dissonance and they read, need to read Tiller's books explaining how these things happen. Here's Gabby, a deceased dog. And again, it's evidence of animal after death survival. Um, it's Sonia Rinaldi's picture. And if you can see, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but there it seems to be the long ear downwards on the right and the nose white, on the left and the eye just behind it. And I think that's another excellent image. It's almost a photograph. Um, now this one is particularly sad because Sonia Rinaldi knew of an animal shelter that had run out of money and run out of food. And they were using this little puppy to see if she could head um, a campaign to raise funds for the animal shelter in Brazil. Um, and a little while later, she got this trans image and realized it was just the same as the puppy, the emaciated, abandoned um, puppy. And when she contacted the animal shelter and said uh, what she'd had, but she, she didn't understand why she had it because the dog was alive. They told her, sadly, the dog had passed away. It had starved and had passed away. Um, so there was ex excellent and remarkable evidence. And hopefully you, um, you can and see the two eyes on right and left, the nose in the center with the white, and the two ears to the right and left. And the more they clean these images up, the clearer they become. Again, just to reaffirm, this central life spark, I believe, is in everything. I believe it's in animals, and I believe it's in plants. And I don't think I would want to go to an afterlife that was a barren world anyway. To me, that wouldn't be and afterlife. And here we've got Silla, uh, uh, Professor Tiller scientifically explains how paranormal phenomena occurs, how we all survive death and have experiences of spirit animals and spirit people. And there's the animals going across the rainbow bridge. And I'm not a scientist um, and the way I ex understand it and have done since my experiences of many years ago is we all have that God spark or eternal energy within us. Um, to give a personal account that was given to me from a medium, a friend at Stansted um, in Essex, the Arthur Finlay College, he told me about an old retired couple and daily the husband worked on his allotment, which was a patch of land where he had some vegetables and plants. And he went there as, an, uh, as a hobby every day. And daily, his telepathic devoted dog, which reminds me of Rupert Sheldrake about um, dogs that know when their owners are coming home. Daily, the telepathic devoted dog carried the husband's slippers in his mouth, welcoming his, his dad back home at the door. And this went on for, the year, for many years. And the wife, you'd see the dog walking up the hall to the door, knowing that her husband would be home in a moment. One day, and it was a shock to her, the dog didn't do this. 
And that was the day she received a tragic phone call that he'd collapsed and passed away at his allotment. And the dog must have known this. Um, because it didn't walk up the hall with the slippers as it did every day for years. After his death, years passed for the lady and the dog, and for sentimental reasons, she kept only the slippers by the husband's favourite chair. But the dog never touched the slippers again throughout these many years. And then one day, the dog awoke, took the slippers to her spirit husband who was appearing at the door, and to take their beloved dog home as the dog laid down with the slippers in his mouth and passed away. And I thought that was a very moving story um, of a personal account. Um, I'll stop there um, because what I was going to say is the Proof Animals Have Soul series looks at religious teachings, spiritual teachings, and spiritual teachings have often come from mediumistic experiences that have been spiritually transformative because they lay at the roots of different religions, the revealed religions. And it's nothing new that animals have souls or that we should show them the compassion or that animals go on into the afterlife with us and that we're all one family. It's there in the different religions. And that's why the animals, uh, the Proof Animals Have Soul series looks at the religions, me being a um, historian of spirituality and psychical researcher, not a parapsychologist. So that's where I'd like to draw it to an end.